witnessed, but is equally driving the risks of abuse. The pace has been fast and uh, some could even say ruthless, uh, yet the legal regime has only been playing catch up, as we shall observe in a minute or two. The legal regime is um, basically the Data Protection and Privacy Act, which came into force in May 2019. And that is the current law currently governing the elephant in the room that is personal data and everything that relates to it, including consent, including use by whoever, either in advertising or whatever purpose they intend to deploy it to. Uh, the BPA defines some of the key terms of our discussion, particularly the phrases personal data, consent, and terms like data subject and data collector. I know that earlier webinars organized by the Personal Data Protection Office uh, have delved a great deal in discussing and highlighting and um, spreading awareness about the roles of a data collector, the roles of a data subject, and I believe that people who have been regularly on the monthly call of PDP or Uganda are well conversant with who is a data subject, who is a data collector, who is a data processor, and who has what obligations under the law. Uh, that notwithstanding, I will uh, make a brief overview of what the law uh, deems to be personal data and what the law deems to be uh, a data subject and uh, the other attendant actors, the data collector, processor, and uh, controller. Uh, personal data, uh, if we may not, is all about information. However, uh, that information uh, could be, whereas it could be text, images, sounds, codes, computer programs, or software, personal data is a specific kind of information. In terms of Section 2 of the Data Protection and Privacy Act, uh, you are dealing with personal data if that information is about a person or that information is information from which the person can be identified and recorded in any form. Uh, the, the definition is very instructive. It is not this or the other. It is information about a person, information for which the person can be identified, and that information is recorded in any form. Once those three elements exist in whatever you're dealing with, you're dealing with personal data. And as we go ahead in this discussion, we will perhaps throw more light on what then are your obligations the moment you find yourself dealing with personal data. Uh, a data subject, on the other hand, is an individual from whom that information, the information that is capable of identifying them, has been requested, collected, processed, or stored. For instance, if you are requested to stand and take a photo shoot, or you're requested to fill a form and indicate your phone number and whatever, for as long as that information is about you, a person, a living person, and that information is capable of identifying you, and that information is recorded, then you are a data subject. The data collector, on the other hand, is the other person who collects that personal identifying information. Um, in terms of consent, consent the Act uh, defines consent to mean any freely given and specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wish, which or she, by a statement or by a clear affirmative action, signifies agreement to the collection or processing of personal data. We need to perhaps spend a, minute, a second or two on this. Um, by the definition section, consent has to be freely given, it has to be specific, it has to be informed, it has to be unambiguous. By unambiguous, uh, the law means clear, not uncertain. 
the, that means there should be no debate, borderline debate as to whether there is consent or not. Okay, if you believe someone give, gave consent, show us the consent. Okay, it should not be something subject to, you know, determination and doubt was there consent or not. So if you find yourself in in the, that debate as to whether there is consent or not, without any basis to prove that there was consent, uh, and that consent was very clear, it was freely given. Uh, indicating that the data subject is in agreement with you collecting or processing or storing their personal identifying information. If you find yourself in that de uh, debate, then the conclusion certainly would be one that you actually did not have the consent. Uh, moving further forward, um, so that is the legal regime as uh, set out in the Data Protection and Privacy Act since May 2019, uh, defining personal data as identifying information, information about a person, uh, defining other important phrases like data subjects, data collectors, and the like. Uh, having looked at the legal regime as it presently is, it is perhaps important to look a little further back in time and try to situate what the legal regime may have been prior to 2019. So before the year 2019, uh, the legal framework was quite uncertain. In fact, there was no written substantial law on data protection and privacy, so much as to give clear and unambiguous entitlements uh, to whoever believed that a certain piece of information actually was their personal data. So those uncertainties are uh, highlighted in uh, some of the cases presented by people who would now call data subjects at the time. Uh, one of the perhaps most familiar cases is the case of the late Alhajina Santege Sevagala against MTN Uganda and SMS Media Limited. Uh, that was civil suit number 282 of 2012. Uh, some three years before, no, not three, some seven years before the enactment of the Data Protection and Privacy Act. Uh, the other case was um, the case of Sikuku Agaitano uh, against Uganda but Limited, which was civil suit number 298, also of 2012. Um, I'll give a little highlight about each of these cases and how they are related and uh, how the court dealt with the dispute uh, relating to what was deemed to be entitlements to protection of uh, the content that the claimants felt they needed protection for. Uh, particularly in the case of Alhajina Santege Sevagala, this was famously the case of the Kola Tunes. Uh, the late Alhaji Nasa Antege Sevagala was famed for uh, his very comical answers to media questions. And uh, these answers were always spontaneous, so it was not premeditated. Um, so uh, those comical answers were often recorded and you know, formed the news day of the day. Uh, so sound recordings of uh, his comical answers gained popularity. Uh, SMS media made them available because saw an opportunity. Yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of euphoria about the gentleman. He was uh, a darling of the media, a darling of the news watchers, and um, made those sound recordings available for download as color tunes to MTN customers. Uh, so. The letter had dragged MTN Uganda and SMS media to the commercial court uh, seeking, of course, remedies that we shall discuss shortly after highlighting what could have been related in, this, in the other case of Sikuku. Uh, in the Sikuku case, uh, which could be particularly uh, relevant to our discussion today, uh, the claimant was employed as a machine operator of the defendant. 
and he was filmed and photographed in the ordinary course of uh, his employment and employer used the photographs in some of his branding materials including gear planner books diaries calendars banners and a variety of print and media platforms including um, the new vision daily monitor uh, ubc television uh, but that filming and photographing was done in the ordinary course of his employment while he was operating the machine which was his day-to-day -day job and what were the decisions of the court in both cases uh having of course as we have observed that these were decisions that we made prior to the year 2019 um and same applies to the time when the the claims were presented to the court in 2012. There was no substantive law on um, data protection and privacy at the time. So the uncertainties manifested in basically a fishing expedition that was embarked on by the claimants. Uh, on the one hand, they were alleging the authors of the respective images, the photographs of them, uh for the sake of the sikuku matter uh in the alhajina santege sevagala he claimed he was uh, he was the author and owner of uh, the copyrights to uh, his comical answers that were recorded and therefore was entitled to protection under the copyrights and neighboring rights act he also argued that um he had protection under the same act as a performer and therefore besides the copyrights to his comical answers he also had the neighboring rights in the performance comprised in his making the statements um similarly in the sikuku case uh, the employee who was the as a machine operator argued that um, uh, he had neighboring rights uh, the act of him going about his work his being photographed and filmed while going about his work was actually a performance and uh, therefore was entitled to neighboring rights under the same copyrights and neighboring rights act uh, both these two cases were decided by uh the same judge we decided by the same the same judge a very of course esteemed judicial officer who is now justice of the supreme court um in both cases however the the land judge in my view rightly observed that the claimants were not the authors of the works in issue um the land judge further observed that the claimants uh, were not the owners of the copyrights. Um, the land judge further observed that uh, the claimants were not performers uh, because they were not actors. Uh, in the case of uh, Nasa Sevangala, the court noted that uh, the answers were spontaneous it was not that he always put up a scripted show at national theater uh, elsewhere uh, for people to come and watch him perform uh, these were spontaneous statements he was making and was making them to the media uh, reasonably expecting that they would end up in the public space uh, so in that sense he was not he was not acting he was not acting as to seek to protect what he would have been doing say the trade of acting um uh, in the sikuku case the court additionally noted that uh, uh, seeking permission is necessary courtesy of the employer merely necessary cutters uh, and in that case the employer uh was found to have informed their employees about the event which was going to take place uh and uh, 
there were other employees who were involved. Some of them testified that they were indeed informed uh, at a meeting uh, that was called and informed as going to be a photo shoot while they were going about their work and they were required to wear new uniforms and um, come and work, but work normally. So the photo shoot would happen, the filming would happen as they're going about the normal course of their duties. Uh, in the premises, um, much as the claimant in Sikuka Gaitano versus Uganda Bati uh, had argued that um, he was entitled to the protection of his image rights. His employer ought to have sought his permission to use his photographs in the advertising material, in the media, and uh, the print uh, of the, the air planner and calendars that had been printed. The court thought otherwise. Uh, that the consent is merely necessary courtesy. It is not a mandatory obligation. If the employer discharged the obligation to, you know, obligation of courtesy, uh, that was sufficient. And the, that discharge was found to have been established through the evidence of uh, one of the managers who testified that had informed the employees beforehand and also the testimonies of the other staff who came to testify on behalf of their bosses that actually they had been informed beforehand that uh, there's going to be a photo shoot. Um, so what we can see at this point in time is that um, before May 2019, before the enactment of the Data Protection and Privacy Act, um, the, the, the personal data, information about a person, information that was capable of identifying that person in any way, if, and that information was, you know, recorded in any way, did not have that very uh, substantive protection. Uh, and uh, the practice of the courts was one of, um, of course, as rightly observed by his lordship in both cases, the claims were not tenable under the Copyrights and Neighboring Rights Act. But of course, that was the closest perhaps the claim would be brought. One would argue that perhaps they could have sued for human rights enforcement under Article 50 on, on account of breach of Article 27 on the right to privacy. But even then, we didn't have the Human Rights Enforcement Act to give enabling uh, guidance on how that could have done the remedies and the procedure. So it was clearly very uncertain at the time. Um, and uh, data subjects grappled. Uh, and that is the, why you notice that they just kept swinging between are we having neighboring rights under the copyright law or are we actually entitled to protection of image rights? But if we argue protection of image rights, where is the legal regime explicitly setting out um, the framework of protection? So that was the challenge at the time. And um, uh, employers got away with, with it, uh, as Uganda but did in the Sikuku case. Um, I believe any other judicial officer would have decided as the court decided in Sukuku versus Uganda, but in the circumstances of the time, uh, except uh, if one would have maybe engaged in judicial activism and the like. Uh, so subsequently, after those two decisions, we had um, another case, the case of Winnie Asege versus Opportunity Bank which was uh, markedly different in, it, in the decision. Uh, the facts, again, what is the common factor in all of them is um, they all related to use of personal identifying information of the claimant. In al Nasa Ntege Seva Gala, it was about the recording of his voice by which he could be identified. Anybody who listened to a recording of those comical answers would not be in doubt who it was. 
he had established identity around that. Um, in the Sikuku case, it was about the photos and the filming. Now, in Asegewini, the claimant was a successful farmer in um, the Teso sub region. She had the hosted many dignitaries at her farm, and her farm had become a sort of a model farm. She'd uh, been engaged in many media interviews, been consulted widely, especially by the, the leaders trying to promote good farming practices and uh, casting light on how the masses could pick a lesson from her and equally uh, have a successful endeavor in agriculture. So her image or a close likeness of the same was used in adverts by Opportunity Bank to promote its AgroSave account. And uh, she noticed her image on billboards across the country and thereby brought the claim. And her claim was very unique in one particular regard. Uh, of, of, of note is that um, she claimed for protection of personality rights that were comprised in her likeness. And um, the court agreed with her on the basis of the common law principles around personality rights, the right to duplicity, the right to privacy, which is the right to determine, to control as and how and when your personal identifying information may be communicated to others. Um, so she was able to demonstrate uh, before the court that um, uh, she, she had been wronged she had a successful farming career and therefore appearing in accounts in, in advertisements that were promoting uh, the bank's products to rural women particularly uh, gave an impression that she had endorsed she had endorsed uh, those products uh, which then, of course, demonstrated false endorsement, misrepresentation, uh, and the fact that the false endorsement was actually gen generating financial benefit for uh, the bank certainly was a situation of, um, of uh, unjust enrichment. So the court in a significant departure from the earlier two decisions, uh, entered judgment for the claimant on the basis of violation of personality rights, uh, which were grounded on principles under the common law. So up to this point, it is evident that without a substantive law on personal data, uh, the practice was that data subjects embarked on fishing expeditions, uh, alleging copyrights, neighboring rights. Uh, but in the one case where a uh, spirited fight was put up for personality rights based on common law principles, the court asserted the rights of the data subjects. However, we may observe later that um, those common law principles on personality rights could not have been comprehensive enough in addressing the challenges presented by the proliferation of personal data for everybody. Because as you may notice in our discussion of Asege Wini, uh, first of all, she was able to demonstrate some celebrity identity, some marketable value it is highly unlikely she would have succeeded without those attributes. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the background upon which uh, legislative endeavors were made in 2019. And the good news is that subsequently, 
our political class, basically parliament and the executive played catch up by enacting the Data Protection and Privacy Act in 2019 to cure uh, those gaps in the legal regime. Uh, with that background, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now time to delve into the main case, the recent decision uh, in Shadi and Alvega versus Tabex International Limited, civil suit number 665 of 2021. This decision appears to have cast some light on the current position of the law on personal data, the usage of personal data and questions of consent and specifically specifically where that data is collected, processed or controlled by an employer. Uh, we analyze this decision, of course, in contrast to those uh, three earlier decisions that we've just noted to highlight the position on the use in advertising and what it means for employers. Um, I invite you to note that um, the plaintiff, Shadi Analvega, was employed as a customer service uh, agent who is otherwise also called a pump attendant at one of the defendant's fuel stations. I believe it was somewhere in Ansana. Um, so her photograph was taken by agents of her employer on the instructions of the employer. Uh, purposely for use in branding materials to advertise the employer's products, uh, fuel products basically, and uh, those advertising materials uh, which eventually carried the image of uh, the pump attendant uh, included billboards, banners, and a variety of tele and online media. Uh, she was subsequently dismissed from employment and uh, thereafter filed uh, this claim before the court. And um, her case was that she was uncomfortable with her photos being taken and used, and especially her employer continuing to use her photos in those branding materials after she's been terminated from employment. In their defense, the employer, Starbex International, which I believe is at every corner you turn around in the city. Uh, the employer alleged that they got the plaintiff's verbal consent to participate in the photo shoot. Of course, the, 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 the principle, the only evidence brought by the employer was evidence uh, in form of witnesses who were uh, her fellow staff. Uh, one of them had been a admin uh, assistant, I think, the other was that also administrative support. And their evidence was that um, it is the practice at the company that for staff, their consent is verbal. For third parties who are not staff of the company, the consent is written. So their testimony was to the effect that whereas there is no written consent, it is the practice, the policy at our workplace that staff give consent verbally. And so there is no need for written proof of the fact that uh, the claimant had the, either consented or not consented. Um, the issues before the court, as the court deemed them necessary, uh, among others, whether the claimant needed to give her consent before her photos were used. Uh, the other issue was whether the breach of the breach of the need to give that consent, which is the breach of privacy rights under the Act, automatically led to a breach of personality rights. Personality rights, as discussed in uh, the Winnie Sege case. Um, then of course the court had to deal with remedies available. Uh, the court uh, on the first issue, which was the question of whether the claimant needed to give her consent before the photos were used, 
the court held as follows. The plaintiff, uh, who is the employee whose photos were taken, was a data subject. And the court referenced the definition of a data subject under the Data Privacy and Protection Act. In essence, the court affirmed that um, a photograph, an image, or a likeness of your appearance, for as long as it's capable of identifying you, makes that personal data. And if it's personal data, and you're the person in respect of whom it is related, then you're the data subject. Um, the court also noted that um, the defendant, in this case, the employer who took the photos was a data collector. And in so holding, the court referenced the definition of a data collector under the Data Protection and Privacy Act. So going forward, it should not be in doubt as to the position of uh, an employer in this whole personal data con uh, conversation. The court has affirmed that uh, an employer is a data collector, and that should be basic understanding. Um, at the time of uh, receiving applications for the job advertised, uh, the employer, as employer, you pick you know, the CVs of the applicants, you pick their academic documents, you pick um, the identification details like national ID, passport, or whatever. Um, these individuals come and appear before the employer and uh, interviews are conducted, uh, marks are awarded, the, the, the applicant is assessed and those marks, the, the, the ratings are stored somewhere. All that is personal data and you're collecting it. That is information about a particular person it is capable of identifying them and you've recorded it in some form. The court also noted that uh, plaintiffs, uh, the plaintiff's photographs amounted to personal data because they identified her and therefore fell under the ambit of the DPP. I think that basically is a repetition of the earlier point noted. Uh, the court further noted that the collection, processing, and storage of personal data are all governed by the DPPA. So there is no more uncertainty. The court has clarified her lordship, Lady Justice Patricia Kahedi Asimwe, the land judge in this particular case, uh, has uh, categor categorically put that the collection, processing, and storage of personal data. So if anybody was having doubts in interpreting the plain language of the Data Protection and Privacy Act, the court has pronounced itself. And that decision, until there is an appellate decision overturning it, is uh, the authoritative interpretation of the law. Um, the court further held that uh, Section 7.1 of the Data Protection and Privacy Act enjoins any person or institution collecting or processing personal data to seek the consent of the data subject. Again, we see a departure from the case of Agaitano Sikuku prior to 2019, where the High Court did not agree with the claimant that the employer had a mandatory obligation to seek his consent before they could use his photos uh, in advertising. That it was mere courtesy. And if they discharged that mere courtesy, they are good to go. That is no longer the case. Because as the court has affirmed, the provisions of section seven, subsection one of the Data Protection and Privacy Act are very clear. If you're a person or an institution or whatever you are, but you're processing personal data information capable of identifying any living or former living human being. And uh, that information is stored in some form. You have a duty to seek the consent of the data subject. The court further noted that the act was intended to ensure that personal data 
is collected, published, processed, or stored only with a clear and unambiguous consent of the data subject. This perhaps casts more clarity that if you're going to collect, you're going to process, if you're going to collect in terms of receiving applications for job openings, you're going to collect, you're going to process in terms of reviewing the applications and rating uh, the applicants on the basis of compliance with, you know, the advertised requirements. If that information is that you're collecting, that your process is capable of identifying any particular person, okay, then you can only do further processing storage with a clear and an ambiguous consent of the data subject. I, I think th there's a bit, there's need for a bit of clarity here. Uh, at the point of um, receiving the applications, you are well within the law. The Data Protection and Privacy Act allows you to collect personal data if it's necessary in a contractual transaction arrangement. In this case, you advertise, so you made an invitation and someone volunteered. The data subject has volunteered their information to you. So at that point, you're not in any breach, you're not in any need of consent to go ahead and process to see if you can shortlist them for the aptitude or to appear before the oral panel. But as we shall note a little, in a little while, if you're going to go outside the purpose for which the information was received, and you do other activities with that data, that is where the clear and unambiguous consent is emphasized, even when you received it lawfully. The court noted further that the importance of consent of the data subject can be gleaned from the use of the word shall, where consent is supposed to be given. Throughout the act, wherever the act talks about consent, there is no may, the word is shall. And the court has affirmed that, that confirms the intention of the legislature was to make first of all consent very important but also mandatory. Moving ahead, ladies and gentlemen, um, the court made further observations, including one that the defendant employer presented no evidence to show that the plaintiff's consent was secured before her photographs were taken. Uh, now, this, this was a very important observation by the court because the evidence of the employer was the two witnesses who were junior staff who indicated that um, uh, for us it is a policy that uh, as staff we don't have to, we don't have to give written consent, but also we were informed and we agreed. The court has said, if you as an employer you don't present evidence of clear and unambiguous consent before the photographs are taken and used, or before that personal identifying information is taken and used, then you're walking on the margins of illegality. Therefore, uh, in the premises, uh, the court was convinced that the employee's personal data comprised in her photographs was taken and used without her consent. And that was in breach of her privacy rights under section seven, subsection one and section 10 of the Data Protection and Privacy Act. Uh, but the court made another very important observation, citing with approval the Kenyan case of Kamande versus Nation Media Group Limited, uh, which was constitutional petition number E, 
2021, a decision of 2022. Uh, in that Kenyan case, the court held that it is only the data subject as a person who had the capacity to give consent to the taking and publishing of her images and her employer possessed no such right. Now, this is very important because in that Kenyan case, um, Nation Media Group argued that it had got the consent to use Kamande's photographs from her employer because it claimed to have got her photographs from the said Mr. Shaheen, who was part of her employment. Uh, and therefore, they had consent. But the court noted that the consent is specifically by the data subject. An employer has no capacity whatsoever to give consent on behalf of their employee for a third party to use their employee's personal data. This point will be highlighted further in our in our small discussion what the decision means for the employers. But briefly, uh, as regards the second issue, as whether the breach of the privacy rights, the breach of the obligation, the mandatory obligation to seek the prior and clear consent of the data subject, it resulted by by implication in the breach on such employees' personality rights. Uh, in that case, of course, the employer had argued that for anyone to have a claim founded on personality rights, her likeness must have marketable value. And of course, the employer was happily following the earlier decision, the principles, the common law principles, uh, as discussed elaborately in the earlier case of um, of uh, Winnie Asege versus Opportunity Bank, uh, where the court entered the judgment for the for the data subject on the basis of uh, personality right, personality rights as governed by the common law principles. Eh? Uh, the court, however, rejected that argument, and uh, the landlady justice noted that it is not tenable that personality rights can only be enforced by the rich and famous. The court further highlighted that Article 21 of the Constitution is very clear. All persons are equal before and under the law in all spheres of economic, social, political, cultural, and in every other respect. In essence, what the court did was to update the position of the law. It can no longer be sustained to argue that merely because person X is little known, is not anybody, perhaps is a cleaner. Nobody knows them out there. So there is no tangible market value to their likeness. There is no extra benefit I am getting by using that person, the, the cleaner's images merely because nobody will deem the cleaner to have endorsed because they have no known following out there. The court, however, argued and uh, not actually argued, but actually held, citing with approval, the views of Dr. Anne Lobel Rosenberg, uh, which are to the effect that depending on the circumstances, the personal characteristics of an unknown person may also possess commercial value, especially in this time and age when fame has become relative and sometimes accidental. I think this is very vividly true. Um, it does not take a lot to have some audience on our various social media platforms as and whether there is any substance beyond the media engagement is another thing. You have a following. So you do not have any specific, um, 
know, celebrity identity like Queenie Asege was, uh, but your personal information may nonetheless possess commercial value. And therefore, the court concluded that the failure to adhere to the mandatory consent the mandatory consent um, requirements under the act leads to a breach of personality rights. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I'm concluding. And therefore, uh, you can no longer argue that um, the claimant has no marketable value. Ladies and gentlemen, that was by and large the decision of the court. But a brief on the question of remedies. The court affirmed the provisions of the DPPA as regards to remedies, specifically that a data subject should have suffered damage or distress, okay, as a result of contravention by the data collector. So whereas the data collector should have demonstrated that consent was given, and on failure to prove that consent, they have breached. For the data subject to have remedies, they should demonstrate that they suffered damage as a result, or they suffered distress. The key words here are suffered damage or distress. In the Naluvega case, Shadia, there was no proof of damages. However, the court found that the mere hurt feelings amounted to distress and therefore she could get some compensation on account of the distress suffered. Um, it would um, appear to me that the earlier case of Asege Wini, if it were to rise today, presents the circumstances which would, which would have proved damage suffered in terms of the false endorsement and misrepresentation on account of her typically celebrity identity as a successful farmer. Uh, and the other circumstances could have been unjust enrichment on account of riding on the coattails of her success among the grassroots population to popularize their product among them. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, allow me highlight the implications. In just a minute, we are really doing bad on time. Just a minute. The implications for the employer, the decision in um, Shadi and Alvega, and what it means for the employer. It means, first of all, the employer has a mandatory obligation to seek the prior and clearly unambiguous consent of the employees before taking and using the employee's personal data in advertising. The other implication is that the employer as a data collector bears the burden of providing, of proving that they obtained the consent. It is not a matter of mere conjecture. Employers should review, in my view, following that decision, the employment contracts to take account of data protection and privacy obligations under the Act. The employer has no right to pass on their employees' personal data to any third party except within the recognized limits of the law. An employer, even as a data controller under the Act, has no right to share their employees' personal data in a business-to-business -business arrangement except with the prior consent of employees as data subjects. And finally, even the data sub, uh, the third party who may have in a B2B arrangement with the, an employer accessed the, 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 the personal data of the employer's employees without the prior and unambiguous consent of those employees is in breach of the act. Ladies and gentlemen, that is, uh, we've come to the end of, uh, of um, my discussion. We are doing bad on time, but um, uh, I really thank you all for the patience. We can, with the guidance of Becca and Anita, we perhaps we could have one or two questions, if any, uh, as we look to closing this discussion. Becca, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Frank. You've done this justice, but we'll wait to hear from the rest of the participants. That was uh, a very uh, resourceful discussion, looking at uh, the different cases, what was there before the Data Protection and Privacy Act, how courts interpreted uh, aspects to do with use of images and around, most especially to do with uh, identifying an individual, 
aspects of commercial benefit and vis-a-vis -vis what we have now and uh, that we have a comprehensive law. So clearly, uh, this is a conversation that cannot uh, be exhaustively concluded in this webinar. But uh, with just a few minutes, if you, uh, this should have ended at midday, but we have a number of questions. So we are requesting if you can stay around for possibly five more minutes or so. We take a number of those uh, such questions and uh, we, we can conclude thereafter. So Frank, the first question is, uh, I think this one, are you, will you be able to share the slides with us for no other dissemination to the participants? Frank, are you there? Okay, as we wait for Frank to come back, we can go to the next question. Does this law only apply to institutions or companies? What about individuals taking photos during events such as weddings and parties and maybe posting them on uh, the public site? The Data Protection and Privacy Act and uh, uh, Section 1 talks about interpretation. Rather, application, it applies to every person, institution. So those individuals are covered under uh, uh, that section. So it clearly does apply to them. Now, the other scenario is Pardon that me, I had lost you. Maybe you could come again on that. Or oh, the first question was about whether you'll be able to share your presentation with the participants. Perfect. Uh, okay. That should be possible. Thank you. So the second question was whether the law, the Data Protection and Privacy Act, only applies to institutions or companies, and uh, if it does apply to individuals, especially those that are taking photos at events such as weddings and parties, and maybe even posting them on public sites such as social media sites, uh, Facebook, threads, and, and the rest. So I was responding to this. Yes, the law does apply to individuals, and it gives under Section 7 the grounds where you should be collecting or taking photos of individuals because that's personal data. So that could, should be clearly indicated. The other is, does URA have the right to review personal data of employees of companies? Frank, over to you. Uh, yes, URA has, um, has power to review uh, the personal data of employees um, under Section 7. Uh, personal data may be collected where the collection is authorized or required by law. Uh, you should note that URA has a statutory mandate to collect and add, collect taxes, but also administer the tax laws, uh, including following up with compliance with your tax obligations. And that could involve you know, a bit of investigation to ascertain what your earnings are uh, and what would be your tax obligations in respect of those earnings. Um, but also where it is necessary for the proper performance of that public duty, yes, it has a, it has a right under Section 7, Subsection 2A, uh, to B. Uh, uh, so any government entity, in terms of performing its statutory mandate, uh, has entitlement to your personal data as relates to the performance of that mandate. Next question. Okay, thank you. This, uh, the other question is, given the numerous activities at different agencies, is it possible to get everyone uh, coming to sign a form such that in the future, these organizations are not sued in case a person becomes a celebrity? I think it's speaking to- I, I am not sure I got that clearly. Given the numerous activities, I think the person is asking about how to obtain consent mm. in respect to use mm. of the person's personal data, though they stretched it mm. beyond to if a person becomes a celebrity and there is added value to it, but it's really sure. around the ground of and uh, of obtaining uh, that particular data, especially around consent. Mm. So well, it's the practicability of making sure that you know everyone signs the forms. Earlier, before mm. a disagreement ever uh, 
can grab. Mm. Yeah, it, there are questions of practicability, but um, I, I believe that corporations, employers, and any other actors involved in data collection and processing can devise creative mechanisms around that uh, if um, they, they, they can consult uh, legal practitioners with who know one or two things about uh, data protection and privacy obligations, uh, th that should be something that the solution can be found for. So there are practicality issues, uh, but a solution can be found if they consult their uh, counsel and either in-house or uh, outside the corporations who have a bit of understanding of the area that can be resolved through the, 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 the the drafting and presentation of all their documentation. Next question. I'm curious to know what happens to an employee's pictures on social media when such employee leaves the company. Uh, that takes us back to the situation of Shadi and Alvega against Stabex. Uh, the position is that um, uh, even when someone has given consent to use of their personal data, that consent can be withdrawn. And uh, if they withdraw that consent, then you have no right to continue using that data. So irrespective of the circumstances under which you got the data, either with consent or without, but if they left the company and have indicated that they no longer wish to be associated, then you have a duty to actually withdraw that content. Short of that, they will have a valid claim for breach of their privacy rights. Next question. Thank you. This seems to relate, uh, they are talking about your presentation to employee, employees. Can you comment mm -hmm. on the use of cloud photos of beneficiaries? Uh, such as an NGO. The use of what photos? Uh, the individuals who are in a crowd. I think they're okay. talking about possibly an NGO, um, sort of adding some parts to uh, increase on the clarity. An NGO possibly mm. goes to the field, uh, they have beneficiaries who happen to be in a crowd and their photos are taken, whether mm. such a discussion covers them as well. Mm. Uh, first of all, it takes us to the basics of um, the act. Uh, the law is specific that uh, the consent has to be clear. And the law also is clear that the consent has to be and must be given. Uh, it would uh, help organizations, NGOs, to adopt practices that, in a way, foresee some of those technicalities perhaps uh, have prior engagement and communication that uh, will be taking some images so they even have at the point of registration uh, where people sign and actually consent that and if present there um, and uh, people who are not educated they are not schooled uh, there should be someone to interpret so there should be a translated copy of whatever you're giving them to sign to us a consent form giving away their rights. Because just look at, we, we do safe border and all these apps on our phones and our digital devices. Um, the obligation of the employer is to, sorry, of the data collector is to demonstrate that they actually secured the consent. For these apps, before you proceed after installing, you have to accept you know, agree to the terms. Once you agree to the terms, you have sealed that evidence for them that they, prior to using your information, they sought your consent. And it was not uncertain, it was written, and you're deemed to have read and understood it and clicked, I agree, I accept. So I do not think uh, the NGOs can run short of mechanisms to, you know, whereas they may not be operating essentially digital platforms, but having uh, user-friendly arrangements where uh, even people in group, 
to, you know, I have signed up somewhere that they're okay with their photos being used. Because short of that, uh, one gentleman already will bring up a claim against you. With Next that, question. Thank you, Pam. We are really way past uh, the earlier indicated time. But this is a conversation like uh, we talked about earlier that cannot be uh, conclusively explored mm. in detail in just an hour or so. So what we'll mm. do, we'll definitely note down your questions. We'll be providing the responses on our social media handles, on our Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, but also on the FAQs page on the uh, PDPO website, www.pdpo.go.ug. You can still reach out to us our inboxes where you have specific questions. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Frank Wadidi for doing this uh, great justice. The discussion has really been a good one. The numbers have also equally been good. Um, I need to point out it's been one of the best attended webinars of this year, 2023. That goes to show you the timeliness of the topic, but also uh, the delivery that you made was actually a good one. So allow us where we come back to you to explore these all related areas uh, for further discussion. And also uh, I'd like to thank the participants who are asking for the handles. Our handles, social media handles are PDPO Uganda. Uh, PDPO and Uganda, there is space. With that, I wish all of you. Becca. Yes. Becca, before you close, uh, you, you began by asking if my presentation could be shared uh probably you could uh, give guidance on that but um if it is up to me i would uh, perhaps encourage whoever is interested to send me a high text on uh, my twitter inbox x inbox the hashtag is um the handle is at f wadidi both the w and the f are uppercase the rest are lowercase at f wadidi uh, send me a text requesting for the same with the email address there, I'll forward it to you. Uh, but if Becca, you could advise on alternative um, arrangements for that, I would be accordingly guided. Otherwise, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you on this subject. Thank you for the patience. Thank you for everyone who has picked interest and taken part. I hope you have picked one or two important um considerations going forward as you go about your business. Uh, in case of anything, uh, PDPO Uganda is, I believe, always available to highlight on any uncertainties around this area of the law. Thank you. I wish you a very good day. Okay, thank you, Frank. Yes, we are um, alive to the fact that some people may not have social media accounts, particularly the one of X, formerly known as Twitter mentioned by Frank. Those that we just had for this webinar, we have your email addresses, so we'll definitely be sharing uh, through email. With that, uh, allow me to end. We are really way past time. Thank you for attending. And we look forward to ensuring that you comply more with the law and you do not, you do not take your employees' personal data for granted just because they're employees and you have more power. Okay, that is it. Have a good day. I'll end the webinar Thank now. Thank you. Bye-bye.